Have you ever heard the phrase, <clears throat> maybe somebody said it to you this week, I've got good news and bad news. And then what do they always say? What do you want first, the good news or the bad news? Maybe you've heard the one about the doctor who's with his patient and says, I've got good news and bad news. What do you want first? And the patient says, well, good news. And the doctor says, you have 24 hours to live. And the patient says, oh, well, we live in a day. <laughs> we live in a day. If you're a guest, you're like, oh, he's one of those guys. Yes, yes. <clears throat> very much. I'm a dad. I have four kids. And so that would fall into the dad joke kind of category, I think. We live in a day where people are drowning in bad news. So we're really desperate for any good news. And the, the strange thing that happens in December leading into Christmas, and of course, these are the holidays, is, is that in the midst of so many exciting things, it tends to be a time of the year where we, we get more tired. Maybe we're tired from the semester. Maybe we're tired because of it's darker earlier. There's all kinds of reasons that we feel tired, but we're not just tired physically, but oftentimes we can get really tired mentally and emotionally. And then no doubt for some of you, what is stressful during this time of year is that the holidays requires you to spend time with people that when you're with them, it creates stress for you. I mean, can we all just admit that? And I'm not trying to tell any secrets about my own family. I love being with my family, but sometimes when we're with our family and for many of you, it's a really good experience, but for some of you, it creates a lot of stress. I mean, you do it, but so there's something that happens in you, holiday parties and spending money and financially, it may be stressful for you. There's something about this season that can stir in you a sense of like, this isn't all that good. And you're feeling worn out. So we live in a day, not only are we feeling tired, but there's a lot of bad news. And I, we have never been the kind of church that stands up here to report the news. I mean, you live in the real world. You see what's happening in the world. Well, here we are during this Advent season with an opportunity to remind one another, one another that in the midst of the bad news, in the midst of the fatigue, there is really good news. And we're going to get to a place at the end of this sermon where I'm going to call you to action, but I want you to begin right now just knowing that the purpose of this season for us as preachers is going to be to tell you the good news and you just get to just rest in it. You just get to experience it. You just get to let it be like a breath of fresh air. So we're spending to do this, uh, we're spending four weeks in the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah is an Old Testament prophet. Maybe you've heard of him. He's fairly well known. He has quite a long book in the Old Testament. He prophesies 700 years before the time of Jesus. You might remember from last week in Andrew's wonderful sermon that God spoke through prophets, uh, specific people for a specific purpose. And oftentimes these prophecies were fulfilled in the lifetime of the hearers, but some of those prophecies actually spoke about things that would come to pass at a later date. These messianic prophecies would take place hundreds of years after the time that Isaiah prophesied them. And Andrew uh, introduced the sermon series really good last week, so if you missed that sermon, I'd encourage you to go listen to it. And for those of you that are here that are doubters, or maybe you're watching online and you're skeptics, about whether or not any of this is real, whether or not Jesus is really the Messiah. I want you to know that the prophecies that Isaiah gives as an example are literally hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. One reason that we can believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah is because he fulfilled over 300 prophecies given by the Old Testament prophets. And so you say, well, I don't know if I even believe any of this stuff. Well, I would say to you, well, look, you would have to ignore a lot of evidence that the Bible is actually divinely inspired by God Almighty and that Jesus is a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. So to those very first listeners, Isaiah has really bad news. And now you're thinking, well, Russell, I thought you were going to encourage us today, but we have to spend some time in the bad news because without the bad news, the good news does not sound as good. So he has really bad news, and the reason is because Isaiah is prophesying dur during a time for Israel in what's called the kingdom period. It's the latter part of what's called the kingdom period, 
And during this period, the kings were appointed by God, and they were supposed to ensure that God's people, Israel, were obeying God's commands. Some did, most didn't. And so Isaiah speaks about the judgment of God on Israel for rebellion, injustice, and idolatry. And so Isaiah has a tough job to do. Israel is disobeying God's commands. God has been long-suffering with uh, being patient with them, has warned them many times. But the time has come for Israel to actually suffer, for them to be conquered by some neighboring nations as a form of God's judgment. So they're conquered by the neighboring nations, first the Assyrians and then eventually the Babylonians. And Isaiah is going to be the one that is going to tell Israel that all of this is going to happen. And Isaiah, like you would be, who is approached by God through the Spirit to do something, to speak on his behalf to the people, and he knows it's going to be a tough message. And so Isaiah asks the Lord, okay, God, how long will Israel have to suffer? Is this like a slap on the wrist? Is this, you know, uh, just like a punishment of a small group of people? What, what is it going to be like? How are they going to suffer because of the, their disobedience? Well, in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 11 through 13, God replies to Isaiah saying, this is how bad it is going to be. Isaiah says, Lord, how long will this go on? And God replied, until their towns are empty, their houses are deserted, and the whole country is a wasteland. Until the Lord has sent everyone away and the entire land of Israel lies deserted. If even a tenth, a remnant survive, it will be invaded again and burned. But as a terebinth or oak tree leaves a stump when it is cut down, so Israel's stump will be a holy seed. So it is going to get really bad for Israel. And I want you to know, like, there is this reality that if you're running from God, there is a point at which God will do what it takes to get your attention. And oftentimes the reason we run from God is because we have manufactured for ourselves uh, like many gods that we think we can rely on for the kind of life we want to live. And if you run from God for a long enough, God will work in the natural order of things, he will work to get your attention. Some of you are here and maybe you're suffering. And the reason is because you're just running from God. And you could simply say to God, God, I'm tired of running from you. I want to be restored into a relationship with you. And God is waiting. Well, here for Israel, Isaiah is saying to them, if... This, this this bad stuff is going to happen, but even in the midst of the judgment, there's this, there's this hope. And we read about it here in verse 13. As a terebinth or oak tree leaves a stump when it is cut down, so Israel's stump will be a holy seed. So here we have a picture. It's a really important word picture of this oak tree leaving only a stump, and it's significant. It, it appears to be dead, but what does Isaiah say about this? Just like God always does, even in the midst of judgment, there is the news of a, the good news of life. This reminds me of what happens in the Garden of Eden. If you, in your mind, will go back to Genesis chapter one and two and three. So in creation, the story is God spoke in existence all, uh, all of creation. And then he creates man and woman. He gives them a command to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They do it anyway, and so they're going to be judged. They're going to be punished. In the midst of the judgment in in Genesis chapter 3, God says to them a promise. God gives to them a promise that from the line, from humanity, would come a deliverer. God works like this. It is not God's desire just to punish everybody. God's desire is to redeem and to restore for people to walk in his love. And by the way, this is one thing we get to do each week when we're together as a church. We get to remind each other that there is good news even in the midst of bad news. I don't know what your week was like. I had some moments this week where it just felt like pure chaos. Have you ever been to a high school girls basketball game? 
there's a moment. It's nothing. My daughter plays basketball. She's the captain, starts, no big deal. I'm not trying to make a big deal out of it, but she's awesome. And um, she's a senior. And um, if you want to hear more about that, I'd be happy to meet you after the service and tell you more about her. She's not in here, so <laughs> she's working with the kids. Um, there's a moment in the game the other night where I'm in the stance. It's it's pandemonium. Parents are screaming at the refs. And it wasn't Jeannie, by the way. Um, parents are screaming at the refs. The parents started screaming at each other. The police come in. And this is like a normal thing. This is like a normal experience. And some of you have younger kids. And you're like, oh, I'm really looking forward to my kids playing sports. Um, but there was just this moment where I'm sitting there. And it was like, this is pure chaos. And I, I literally closed my eyes and I was just thinking to myself, can I experience peace in the midst of this chaos? You see, what you get in a relationship with God is the good news that in the midst of the chaos, there is peace. And you cannot find it any other place than the Messiah. And this is what Isaiah is about to tell the people of Israel. So in Isaiah chapter six, God tells the prophet to speak, and then he does in seven, eight, nine, and 10. And then in chapter 11, he begins to share some good news. Okay, so we're at the good news now. The good news is, is from that burnt stump, a shoot will grow. Isaiah is about to prophesy that a Messiah will be born from the people of Israel. And then in later chapters, he's going to describe this, this new empire that this Messiah will build. So look with me at Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Jeannie read it so beautifully. It says, There shall come from forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Now we know that the shoot from the stump of Jesse, so Jesse is David, who's a king's father, which you'll know why I say that in just a minute. We know that this shoot from the stump of Jesse is speaking about Jesus. Jesus even says that it's speaking about him. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, Jesus says, I am the root and the descendant of David. And the prophet Jeremiah, another prophet, says something similar. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Now, this is not the first time that Israel is promised that God's not going to give up on them. It's not the first time. In fact, in each area uh, era of Israel's history, God reassured them that there would be deliverance, and that a new empire is coming. The Bible calls this a covenant. So God is making, again, a covenant with Israel to establish a new kingdom through a remnant of faithful people. And at just the right time, this deliverer, a savior, a Messiah would come to make this new kingdom possible. Here's the good news. Anyone who hopes in this Savior can experience peace in the midst of chaos. What's going on in your mind? Like, like what is the level of chaos that you're experiencing in your mind? When I was preparing this, I began to think about the most chaotic experience or maybe the most chaotic place in the world, and I thought of New York City's Times Square. Raise your hand if you've ever been to New York City Times Square. Yeah, many of you have. I figure you all are rich and you like to travel. <laughs> I love to go there, but I'm not super into the shops. I'm not super into the typical. Once you go to Times Square a couple times, it kind of is what it is, you know. But one thing I love to do, and I went there not too long ago, is stand in the middle of the passing tourists and the talented performers and the persistent beggars, the sneaky criminals, the waiting police, and just the chaos of the flashing lights and the noise and the smells, just to see if for a moment in that most chaotic place, I can experience peace. Maybe there's something in your world that feels like that to you. You have every reason in the world to be distracted or to set your eyes and your minds on the bad news and the chaos and the things going on around you. But what if you had a relationship with God where in the midst of no matter what was happening, 
you can experience peace. Some of you are trying to do that. I mean, you have functional saviors in your life. You know what? The world offers a lot of saviors, and I'm not going to list them. But a savior is anything that you run to when you're stressed, when you're hurting. It's anything. And can I suggest to you that these savior that will give to you what you need, the peace that you want to experience in the midst of chaos is Jesus. And this is who Isaiah is talking about. I want to be real clear. The Christian faith teaches that the one savior that will give you the life you most desire is Jesus. I want you to keep in mind that the very first listeners just heard Isaiah talk about their inevitable destruction. And this is bad news to them, but you know when the bad news is really bad, the good news is even better. And Isaiah is going to describe this Messiah. Look at verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And don't miss this for because this is important. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would descend on a person for a specific purpose for a limited period of time. And so when Isaiah is describing this Messiah, this deliver as one that the Holy Spirit is going to rest on, it makes him different. He's different than other world leaders. He's different than others offered saviors. And this happens actually at Jesus' baptism, Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus is this promised deliverer. He's this promised savior. And Isaiah goes on to describe him even more. Look at verse three of Isaiah chapter 11. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see. And I'm about to explain all this. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness, the belt of his loins. What Isaiah is describing here is not some weak, limited savior. Isaiah is describing an all-encompassing, glorious, majestic savior. I, I don't know what is creating chaos for you or what will create chaos for you in the next few weeks or even next few months. But here's the thing, if your savior, if the way you see Jesus is this like little short Yoda kind of figure who occasionally has some good things to say and gives you a pep talk every now and then, that will not last. What Isaiah is describing is true about this uh, Messiah is that the Messiah is going to judge the world. He's not an ordinary judge who will be swayed by superficial knowledge. He will judge impartially and in righteousness. The needy and the poor will not be oppressed by him as they often are by other human leaders. He's different. He's majestic. He's awesome. The oppressed, in fact, will be the beneficiaries of his justice, and the wicked will be slain. The reign of Jesus will be characterized by righteousness and faithfulness as their inner as, as if they were integral parts of his clothing as a belt and a sash. This is good news. This Messiah that we look to for peace in the midst of chaos, this good news that a deliverer has come and will come again, is establishing an empire. Isaiah prophesies this actually in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. He says, For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. You see, this empire is going to be worldwide, universal. And everyone has an opportunity to enter into this king's kingdom. Everyone has an opportunity to turn to this Messiah for salvation. 
Luke talks about this a bit in Luke chapter 13, verse 29, and people will come from all over the world, from east and west, north and south, to take their places in the kingdom of God, this kingdom established by this Messiah, this deliverer. But don't forget that this deliverer rises from Israel like a branch from a stump, a hopeless stump. And so if you're like me, I'm thinking, why would God do this? Like, why does God, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the bad news, some of which we create for ourselves, why does he offer in an ongoing way this good news? Because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. How does that make you feel? Like, are you encouraged by this? Do you believe it to be true? Do you know it to be true? In just a few moments, we're going to take the Lord's Supper, and it is for us as Christians an opportunity to reflect on and remember that a deliverer has come. And of course, this deliverer did not just, sh- he, as Matt mentioned in, during the worship, he, he was born as a humble servant and he grew up and he lived and he ministered and he eventually died on a cross. And in a mysterious exchange, this is an important part of the good news, in a mysterious exchange, his death on the cross becomes an opportunity for people that have rejected God who have sinned to be forgiven of that sin and be given new life. You see, Jesus did not just die on the cross, but he was raised from the dead. There is a deliverer. His name is Jesus. So in the midst of the chaos, either the chaos that's brought into your world by somebody else or the chaos that you're creating for yourself, there is a deliverer. Why would God continue to invite you to experience it? Because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Do you believe it? What will you do about it? So we're going to take the Lord's Supper in just a few moments. And by taking the Lord's Supper, we're remembering the death of Jesus, the broken body and the shed blood. But in some ways, it's also, well, in every way, it's also an opportunity for us to renew our commitment. It's a renewal of our commitment to Jesus as the Savior, as the Deliverer, as the Messiah of our lives. So with that in mind, I'm going to call you to action. First of all, I would just invite you to express gratitude to God. I don't know about you, but there are some days where I'm like, God, just just thank you. Thank you that in the midst of all this chaos, all this bad news, that there is good news. His name is Jesus. So during our time of prayer in just a few moments, which we're going to have plenty of time for, I just want to encourage you to express gratitude to God. And then I also just want to say a word here about how you can experience this kind of a relationship with Jesus where you're reminded of the good news. It requires being intentional about inviting people into our lives close enough that they know when we're struggling. So if you're here and you are struggling, I would ask you, who knows about it? Who knows about it? One thing, you know, as church leaders, what we really are in, we're in the business of facilitating relationships. As a part of that, we get to preach and do music and things like that. But really what we're in is in the business of facilitating relationships, of facilitating a relationship between you and God and between you and one another. And so what I would say to you, like if you're here and you're struggling, who knows about it? Will you tell them? Because you need people in your life that will remind you of the good news, that a deliverer has come and will come again. We anticipate the second coming, but we need to be reminded in the midst of struggle that there is good news. Express gratitude to God. Invite others into your life who can remind you of the good news. So let's think on and pray about these things.